Hey guys, so today's video is going to be on a uh, simple CPU architecture. It's pretty similar to the architecture of the 68K processor, which we've dealt a lot with so far. Um, but it just it's honestly just simpler. Um, so for example, our registers, as we know with the 68K, we have D0 to D7 and A0 to A7, as well as like a stack and a couple other things. But on a simple CPU, you have K0, K1, K2, and K3. Those are your registers, and each one of them has a maximum length of 8 bits, just like the 68K. Um, there's something called a condition code. And the condition code, there's two of them. There's N and there's Z. So N like is uh, it's pretty much a boolean so if you don't know what boolean is that's true or false so negative so if a number is negative then n will be true if n is not negative it's, if, if it's positive then n will be false and zero just tests if a number is zero so any non-zero number will be false and any zero number will be true for z Okay, and some more notation. We have our immediate numbers that follow certain form. So we have IMM3, which is a 3-bit immediate, and then IMM4, a 4-bit immediate, and IMM5, which is a 5-bit immediate. IMM3 has bits 0 and one. Uh, those are equal to the value, and then the the bit number two equals the sign. So bit number two signifies if the number is positive or negative. IMM four is again a four bit immediate, except that it's a twos complement notation of a number. So again, that's just a negative number in binary. And IMM5 is just any 5-bit unsigned number. Okay, and finally we have our sign extend instruction, which is SC8X, the X being the thing that you want to extend. And as we know from the 68K, when you extend a number, let's say if it's 4 bits, when you extend a number, it becomes this. Well, hold on. Zero, 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 zero. Zero, zero. As far as I can tell, SC8X is sign consistent. So if you have a twos complement number, so for instance, 1101 is negative 3, then your extended number would be this, where this is your original and up here this is your original, except that this is a twos complement number. So it stays faithful to the sign, as far as I know at least. If I'm wrong, please feel free to correct me. Okay, and as for instructions, we're just gonna go through a couple. Um, ba ba ba, because there's a few of them. Uh, so in the 68K processor, we're pretty used to things being along the notation of command and then we have our source and then our destination with a simple CPU or with this simple CPU you have your command and then you have your destination and then you have your source and that's relatively consistent so we'll see that in an example Okay, so first one is load, and we'll do R1 and R2. And what does this mean? We have access to a temporary variable when we're doing this. Uh, when we're describing the background behind what these commands are doing, we have a certain degree of liberty. There's a lot of pseudocode that we can just kind of pop in. So whenever you're 
loading like this or whenever you're dealing with a value you always want to have you always want to change a temporary variable first and never ever ever the register itself so our temporary variable will be equal to the memory location of R2 so our temporary variable is an address and now R1 will be equal to temporary so you're loading R2 into R1 so now we're going to do one that's a little bit similar called store we have R1 and we have R2 okay so we have the memory location of R2 and we're changing the memory location to R1 so you're storing um, R1 inside the memory location of R2 this goes against a little bit what I was saying with the destination and the source ordering it's a little bit confusing um, it'd be probably be best to, to just memorize this and I forgot to increase the program counter with these so with every command you always want to increase the program counter every single one you always have to remember increase the program counter okay so that's load and store and those ones are probably the most confusing out of all of them the other ones are pretty self-explanatory so let's do subtraction let's do sub r1 r2 alright so we have our temporary variable still and we're subtracting r1 from r2 so here we're going to have r1 minus r2 so our temporary variable will be equal to r1 minus r2 and now since r1 is our destination and r2 is our source r1 will be equal to temporary now we have to do a couple checks here since we're dealing with numbers and we have to attach our condition codes to our destination register we have to do some pseudocode so if our temporary variable is equal to zero then that means that our Z condition code will be equal to one and if it's not then our Z condition code can be zero so again if temporary is zero then our Z flag gets put up that means that the number is zero that's our zero flag if it's not zero then zero will be one so this is basically false here and true here now we have to check for negatives so if our temporary variable is less than zero that means that n will be one else n equals zero and of course again at the end of all that we increase the program counter Oops, pc equals pc plus one all right let's do some bitwise stuff so take that out addition follows kind of the similar pattern okay let's do or i imm5 so remember that imm5 is just a five bit immediate number um, it's an unsigned number so da, da, da. or i means bitwise or of an immediate number so we have our immediate number um, but what's strange is that we don't actually have two things here when you're doing a bitwise operation like this typically you have two things that you're comparing right so with this we're comparing k1 k1 is kind of like the default register that we compare to with bitwise operations like this so we have our temporary variable again and we're comparing with k1 so we do k1 bitwise or with immediate five all right so we have temp k1 will be our destination so k1 will be equal to temp and the way that we know that's k1 is just common sense really because we can't store a valuable 
inside the immediate. So where would we put it? We put it into K1 because that's the only register we're dealing with. So now we have to do our tests again. So if temp is 0, then our Z flag is 1, else Z is 0. If temp is smaller than 0, then N is 1, else N is 0. And then finally, PC equals PC plus 1. So that's bitwise. Now we'll do a branch. So there's a few branches you can do. You can do like branch if the thing is zero, branch if the thing is not zero, um, branch if the thing is a positive number, so positive. And it's, this one's a little confusing. It's like branch positive zero or something like that. Uh, this is only here to tell you that you're dealing with the Z condition code, but um, for example, we're going to just do BZ, keep it simple, but the um, the concept definitely transfers to the other branches. So BZ has an argument of immediate 4. Um, compared to the 68K, where the 68K you can just have a label where you can do like a oh, branch loop or something, and it'll just go to loop. Well, you can't do that with a simple CPU. You have to tell it exactly how far it has to go when it's branching. So that's where the immediate 4 comes in. Now I'm guessing you use immediate 4 because immediate 4 is always going to be negative since it's the 4 bit 2's complement representation of an immediate number. Um, I'm guessing it's negative because uh, we're working with a stack right now. And if we remember with a stack, it grows this way. So you're subtracting from your addresses all the time. So what we do here is super simple. If our Z condition code is one, so if if when we're branching, if if the thing that we're dealing with is in fact zero, then we increase our PC as per normal, but we also add on the spacing dealt with in our immediate four. Imme immediate four here is our spacing again. But um, PC is eight bits because it's an address, right? So we have to sign extend to eight bits our immediate four. And this will bring us to the chunk that we want to go to. That's our branch. And if Z is not zero, then we just increase the program counter as normal and we forget about and we forget about branching okay so that's going to be part one of the simple CPU architecture next I'm going to be dealing with data flows and things like that in the ALUs and the memory and all that fun stuff so stay tuned for part two